Good evening. I'm sorry to be so hurried, but I've got to catch a 10.30 flight back home. I've got an 8 o'clock sort of critical meeting tomorrow, and I'm giving a, a public lecture tomorrow at 10 at the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. So I'm here till 8 o'clock. We'll get done when we get done. Uh, this is now my third time speaking here, and I've enjoyed it immensely. I hope to come back regularly. But I'm challenged. I don't like to come back to places and say the same thing. I think it's you know, repetitive and stupid, and I've got a lot to say. So I actually was challenged this time and came up with a new talk, uh, a completely new talk, which has never been seen before. Maybe it will, the only time it will ever be seen, depends on the reaction is. And um, it, it, it relates to what the, what the Rav was speaking about, because th this last week's Parsha is really appropriate. And again, I'm not going to get into a long Torah thing here, but I, I, I think we have to you know, ground what we're saying. You know, last week's Parsha was about the Miraglim, about the spies who were either sent by Moshe or sent by the people, depending upon you know, which uh, uh, commentator you say, and that 12 people went to see the land and came back and gave a report. And we know that Yoshua and Kalev gave a great report. And 10 people said, forget it. You know, we're like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and these guys are giants, and they're going to kill us. And we know that this whole episode is the basis for the worst day in, in Jewish history. It's Tisha B'Av, right? In other words, when the Miraglim came back and brought the bad report, that's when everything went wrong. We didn't go into the land. We were exiled in the desert for 40 years. And it becomes the source of the destruction of the temples, the Holocaust, everything ties back to that date. And what you learn from this is you've got to be really careful, not just what you say about people, but what you say about the land of Israel. And what seems to be the sort of Jewish flavor du jour um, is that we're critical. And by the way, that criticism is part of who we are, right? I mean, whether you believe President Paris, who says to be Jewish is to be dissatisfied. Okay, and I'm not, you know, into creating a Stalinist regime of only saying nice things about Israel. But it seems to me that the criticism of Israel and who we are has gotten completely out of hand. And that what we have failed to realize is really how incredible the country is, what unbelievable achievements. And I spend a lot of time talking about business and startup nation and crowdfunding, and I'm not talking about any of that tonight. But I'm going to share with you sort of my views ranging from hummus to sex to uh, uh, children and uh, uh, wildlife about Israel, and here we go. So there's a newspaper out in Asia called the Asia Times. There's a writer there named Spengler who has this incredible statement. He writes a lot about Israel and about many things. He writes, envy surrounds no country on earth like the state of Israel, and with good reason. By objective measures, Israel is the happiest nation on earth. Well, you can look at our health. Our cancer cure rate is among the highest in the world. Israelis are covered in terms of their health care system. You should be so lucky, okay, to have, you know, Israel's health care. I know the people from America simply can't believe it when they come to Israel. You'll find out in a second here about our longevity. Our hospitals are world class, most medical device patents per capita, and President, uh, the presidential candidate Romney couldn't believe, said, how is it you guys spend 8% of your GDP, by the way, the US number is 15%. I, I, I shudder to think of what the uh, UK number is in terms of uh, you know, percent of GDP. But in any event, let's look at birth rates. It starts with children, right? Israel today has a three per woman birth rate. The US has 2.1, which is just about break even. You need a little bit better than two to actually keep your population afloat. Greece, Italy, Spain are all about 1.4. And if you want to understand the origins of their financial crisis, when you have no children and your society doesn't grow, it says, it says a fundamental thing about the society. Number one says you're narcissistic, okay, that you're not interested in bringing new life into the world. It says that basically you don't even believe in the future because when you stop having children, that is, this, that is the, the greatest sickness that a society can have. It basically is collective suicide. And on this basis, and by the way, many countries, Japan have a terrible birth rate. UK is up, I think, in the high 1819 region. Almost break even, but not quite. 
But birth rate becomes a, a really important criteria. And what's interesting is that this birth rate is not just, I mean, well, it's Arabs, right? The Jews aren't having kids. But the reality is that the Jews are having 2.9 kids per woman in Israel. Now look at our life expectancy. Uh, if any of you want to move to Israel, you can add now two years to your life. If you come from America, you get to add three years to your life. But Israel literally is now number four in the world in terms of life expectancy. The only guys who are beating us are the Japanese and the Swiss, okay? And just by a hair. We're, we're, we're tight on there. And this, again, is all of Israel. This is Arabs, Jews together. This is the whole of Israel society having one of the highest life expectancies in the world. And by the way, it's, it's only going up. Now, what I love about Israel is not only do we live long, but we eat a lot. And in fact, if you plot those countries that live long and who are fat, we're right up there. It's us in Greece. Okay, and this is good news for me, I mean, with all due respect. Um, in other words, look, it's, it's easy if you, like, like the Japanese, you have no one who's fat. I mean, it's unbelievable. One and a half percent obesity, it's, that's, there's no, no, no fat Japanese, except for the sumos who are deliberately fat, okay? The Chinese are not far behind, but guess what? Israel is right up there with Singapore in terms of life expectancy, except we eat and enjoy ourselves, okay? And you ask yourself, how is that possible? Just, it's confounding the laws of physiology and medicine. And maybe we'll come and see some interesting data as a result of that. Cancer survival rates. Okay, take a look at the EU, look at the US, and look at Israel. So right now, if you're a male, better to get cancer in the US than in Israel. But if you're a female, much better to have it in Israel. Okay, and really bad idea to have cancer here in the EU. You know, really bad idea. Meaning that Israel has a much higher rate of cancer survival than uh, than the EU, and we're really pretty much neck and neck in terms of overall with the US. Now, this is a, a slide from Spengler. You really can't see this, but what he did is he plotted two kinds of data. He plotted the birth rate, and you'll see Israel up there at, at 2.8, and this is an old slide from several years ago. It's now at three. And those other dots are all the other countries in the OECD. And he plotted, in addition to fertility rate, he also plotted suicide rate, because he figured that people who have lots of babies and don't kill themselves are happy, right? In other words, that's, that's the reality. And if you look, well, this woman's looking at me like I'm nuts, okay? But the reality is, you'll, we'll come to more happiness in a second. But the reality is, if you look at it objectively, if you produce children for the future and you have the lowest suicide rate, look at where Israel is on the suicide rate per 100,000 relative to everybody else. We have a suicide rate below 10, whereas other countries have between 10 and 20, and there are a whole bunch of them out there in the 30 and 40. I mean, three to four times our suicide rate. And if you look at, for example, data that just was printed about a year ago in Israel Yom, about 83% of Israelis are happy, 70% are proud, 80% wouldn't live anywhere else. And Gallup, which you'll see in a second, does an international happiness survey. They actually go and they ask people, how do you feel? Because that's a competitive thing. You want to be a happy country. It's not just my Mishigas. This is Gallup poll. So take a look at how Israel does. Not too bad. We are number eight as of the World Happiness Survey. Okay. Uh, actually, I saw some data that showed us moving up to number seven, and I'm looking for where that slide was. But look who we're up against. We're in tie for number eight with Switzerland and Canada. New Zealand's just a little bit ahead of us. These Scandinavians seem to be thriving in a, in, a, in a big way, but I don't see the UK here. I don't see the US. They're down really at much, much the US uh, was 14, the UK was 17. In terms of the Gallup poll, this is not Zionist propaganda, this is a Gallup poll. Now, you ask yourself, what is happening here? And I haven't had a chance to really develop this slide yet. This came to me from a loan program where I just spent some time with. And he was upset. He said, look, I can't hear what you're going to say. Show me some of the slides. And I started showing him these happiness slides. And he said, no, homos. And I thought, wait, is this guy like watching too much Zohan? You've seen the movie, The Zohan, right? Where you basically, you know, like tinkle a bell, say disco, disco, and get some homos and Israelis are happy. But he says, no, 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 no. There's, there's scientific proof that homos is going to make you happy. And I said, you know, excuse me, in Hebrew, you know, he's like, 
Alec, okay, is this, this can't be true. And boom, Google it about hummus and happiness. It turns out that it's a trifo, uh, this is again, this is something that's about an hour old in my, I just stuffed this in here after sitting with Alon beforehand, that basically hummus will increase your serotonin, okay, which is a key element in the brain. And it explains a lot to me. I would say that most of my excessive weight is hummus driven, okay? I'm a, I'm a hummus maniac, okay? And I always feel better after eating a really good plate of hummus. I don't know what it is. I like it. I don't feel the same way when I eat pizza. I don't feel the same way when I have a steak, but when I have a good plate of hummus, I am a happy camper. And trust me, we're gonna do more research on this and come back. But there's another reason we're happy. Pfizer, is there a better name in sex in the world? I don't think so. And excuse me, Rabbi, but this is, this is applied Torah here, okay? The reality is that Pfizer has now tested people around the world and asked them questions about their satisfaction and about their frequency of sexual activity. And it turns out that Israel has now come in number two. We gotta work harder, okay? But we are now number two in terms of frequency of sex, right neck and neck or whatever with the Brazilians. The Brazilians are ahead, okay? We've gotta catch Brazil. But take a look at how we're doing relative to Singapore, Korea, and Taiwan. Israelis have sex 7.7 times per month. Now, I was trying to ask them, is that actually extrapolated, not counting mikveh periods and, and whatnot, but it, we have, I haven't gotten deep into this data yet. But the reality is, according to Pfizer at least, Israelis are the second most sexually active country in the world. That will certainly make you happy. Um, now, if you look at what's happening in terms of parties, Okay, Israel is now become known as an international party capital. Okay, don't take my word for it. First of all, go to Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or any of the other cities. I mean, Israelis like to dance and like to have parties. We have more festivals now in my town of Jerusalem than I can ever remember. This week is the Light Festival. We now just opened up that new train station in Jerusalem. You can't stop but see what's going on. There's this vibe going on. And guess what? Not only the Jews and the Zionist propagandists like myself, are getting this, but Lonely Planet called Israel a top 10 city for 2011. I don't like this, but a modern sin city on the sea, kind of San Francisco in the Middle East. Forbes Magazine, 2010, named Tel Aviv a top party city, a hedonistic, multicultural, Mediterranean metropolis, a city that never sleeps, bartenders who are notoriously generous with alcoholic beverages, nightlife is cosmopolitan, ceaseless, and unpretentious. And this is not in your Jewish Chronicle God forbid, and this is not in your Fathom or other Jewish, this is Forbes magazine, Lonely Planet, that's what they're talking about, Israel. Now, of course, there's other kinds of happiness which we all know, proper for Brangen, these happen to be not Chabad Hasidim, a little bit, this looks like Toldos Aaron, actually, but even Toldos Aaron can have a good time. And, uh, you know, a little Lachaim will do you a lot of good. Now, family life, okay, it's extraordinarily important if you try to understand Israel today, to get into the Israeli family. And again, we talk about births. Again, the Muslim birth rate is going down and fast. We just crossed over, by the way. More Jewish births, a higher rate of birth rate in Jerusalem than Muslim births, which is incredible. By the way, we've over overtaken the Christians long ago. The Christians are way, way down in, in, the, in the middle, in uh, Israel. But in Jerusalem now, we're having more Jewish babies than uh, Muslim women are. But what's amazing about Israeli family. I don't have data on this and you can help me. By the way, I'm open to anybody help me build this. We can crowdsource this, this slide presentation. Um, one of the things which people in Israel don't appreciate is the fact that grandparents see their kids every weekend. They see their kids and their grandchildren every weekend. Now, in most countries of the world, this is a strange behavior. In Israel, if my son doesn't bring my triplets, my grandchildren triplets, to see me and my wife every weekend, every Shabbos, he's a bad son. Okay, I don't care what the excuse is. I want those kids in my house, at my Shabbos table. Okay, he can go out for lunch if he wants to to the in-laws or somewhere else, but he's in my house. And it's not just me, but it's literally the entire society. You would be considered weird some kind of a, a, a ben sorel more if you did not take your kids home to see Abba and Ima. Okay, and in America, I, I say this to people, I've said that part when they look at me like I'm completely nuts. 
Because if you live in Chicago and LA, I'm sorry, it doesn't work. Okay, even if you live on two sides of London, it probably doesn't work. People don't see their, their parents every week. Okay, but in Israel, that is part of the culture. And we have a really, really strong family structure. Um, children rule the nation. Not only do we have a lot of children, you feel this, but Israeli kids run wild, let's face it. And um, I got a taste of this when I first moved to Israel. I came with, my oldest was four, M Moshe, the, the, the father of the triplets. And we arrived in Israel on Sukkot. And there was a, it was Erev Sukkot, and on, you know, about three, four hours before the Chag was coming in, I got a knock on the door, and there's an 11-year-old from next door who says, hey, in our neighborhood, we're having a sukkah hop, which I never heard of before, coming from LA. What's a sukkah hop? The kids go around the neighborhood looking at sukkot, and they give an award to who has the best sukkah. And I said, this is why I made Aliyah. This is wonderful. And he goes, look, I'll, I'll take your, you have a, a son here, right? It's a cute little four-year-old who's running around. Says, Momo, I'll take him with me. And I asked my wife, I said, well, you think it's okay? He's 11, we can let him go out. He said, yeah, Israel, fine. So at about 8.30 after we're halfway through the meal, we said Kiddush, the kid comes over, grabs Momo, off he goes, holding his hand. 9 o'clock, 9.30, no Momo. 10 o'clock, no Momo. 10.30, two hours, this four-year-old is now out somewhere with the next door 11-year-old, no Momo. And I turn to my wife, she goes, well, maybe you should go out. And it's about 10.45, I start hunting the neighborhood. And finally, in the public park, I find about 20 kids, oldest one, 12. That was the oldest kid of the 20. At 11 o'clock at night, arguing about which family to give the sukkah hop prize to. And I thought I was in some kind of a weird science fiction movie. Because in America, you don't go into a public park after 8 p.m. at night. And here are, you know, 20 12-year-olds, and they were like, there were, Momo wasn't the littlest. There were some two and three-year-olds, and they're just sitting there hanging out in the public park arguing. And there's not a parent in sight. And you look at this and you say, wait a minute, what, what this is different. This is, a, this is not the culture I'm used to. But it's absolutely a, a very interesting and wonderful culture because the kids are free. When they're seven years old, you give them a carticia, and they get on a public bus. In LA, you would be taken away to jail if you put your kid on a public bus. Your kid wouldn't come back, probably. Okay? But in Israel, the kids run like that. The youth movements in Israel. You guys all know what a Tenuat Noar is? They all, you know, is there an adult there? Is there, you know, in America now, there's this big debate about whether you can have gay, you know, scoutmasters. In Israel, there's no debate because there is no scoutmaster. It's kids. Okay, you send your kid, that it's the biggest excuse for health care in the world. Your kid at age 11, at 10 o'clock at night on Shabbos night, says, bye, I'm off to the sneeze. And at 10 o'clock, they're out. And they come back at 12 o'clock and you're saying, wait a minute, you're, you're 10 and 11 years old. What are you doing off on your own? And they said, dad, this is Israel. And then there's Lag Omer, which is the complete holiday of health care. The holiday of, 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 quote, irresponsibility or disabandonment. You know that in the week before Lagba Omer, two businesses go on alert in Israel. Number one are the supermarkets. And every single supermarket uh, trolley, or whatever you call them, you know, basket, the, uh, uh, which, which you push around a supermarket, they're all locked down because everybody is, all the children are stealing them or borrowing them. It's down at the school. And then the other business which locks down are all the construction sites because they're trying to prevent the kids from using the trolley to fill it with wood to make their bonfire. Because on Lagba Omer, everybody makes bonfires. And these kids go out at night and say goodbye to the kid. This time they leave early at 7 or 8 o'clock because the fires will be lit. And you expect they're out at 7 or 8, they're coming back at midnight. No, they come back if you're lucky at 4 or 5. And these are 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds and 12-year-olds. So I'm not sure I'm entirely proud of this phenomenon, because it sounds like a little bit of irresponsibility, but it, is, but it combines with this amazing culture of the kids running wild. What they do on their annual field trips at school would make your hair stand on end. Kids die, God forbid, has v'shalom, all the time, because they, they climb up mountains and walk along vadis in the Golan, and things that in America you would be sued you couldn't do that for a school trip. 
But in Israel, it's part of the process because these kids are going to go to the army. As soon as they're done with this, they hit the army and that's boom, a different kind of reality. So there is something really important. The kids actually have a, a sense of service because for example, the best and the brightest kids are competing to get behind, get inside an ambulance. You guys all know about Magen David Adon. I mean, if you think in Israel, if you're choking on a piece of chicken, that they're sending in a professional EMT to save you, think again. Because the person who was in that MBA unit, which you might have paid for from Kinloss or another shul here, is a 16-year-old volunteer. There is not an EMT. They don't exist in Israel. We don't have emergency medical technicians. We have 16-year-olds who compete to get into that MDA ambulance. And so the kids are brilliant. And by the way, they kick out a bunch. You have to actually, and then you go through a course. And you go through the mass, they go with a course called uh, Tahran, uh, which is, uh, uh, there's like an Irua Rav Nifgaim. Okay, in other words, these 16 year olds are being trained to handle a event with a lot of you know, mass casualties. And again, you know, you live in Israel and you don't necessarily realize how strange it is until you actually encounter people abroad and you tell them about this reality. And there's a, a huge impact of this kind of child rearing, which is called the Bamba effect. You guys all know what Bamba is? Bamba, the, the peanut soft snack. It turns out that Bamba is what every Israeli parent gives their child as the first food. It's easy, it melts, and you don't choke on it. So every, and they have a cute little baby as the mascot for Bamba. It turns out that today in America, you can't give your kid a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to take to school because you'll be sued, because it'll infect somebody, because somebody else is going to be smelling the nuts and has nut allergies. It turns out that statistically, again, according to the Journal of Allergy and Immunology, which is a big medical journal, Israeli kids have a 90% less incidence of nut allergy. We don't have nut allergies in Israel. And they have now traced this, the fact that Israeli kids eat bamba. So by giving the 